My name is Matt, welcome back to the shop, and if you have seen part one to this video um, already, I'm removing that, the sound was terrible, and it's because one of the speakers in my, uh, in my monitor's gone out, well, screen has gone out, so I could only hear one channel, not the other. Regardless, um, the sound was absolutely atrocious, so I'm going to redo it again, um, but this is going to be a bit of a hurried one. And I also wanted to edit some of it, listening back to it. it did, and there was too much of my, I'm getting pissed off about this opinion instead of actually answering the whatevers. So if you've already seen part one, this is a bit longer than that. Um, so skip to this time index you can see right now. That will give you, send you to the bit you didn't hear, so on and so forth. I'm not going to repeat it word for word. Just something similar, you know, along them lines, the talking points. So let's, I'll shut the fuck up and let's just crack on. So I'm going to start with the questions right away. And our first question is, so is there a story behind this engine? How did you come up uh, with the Alpha Dan in a four cylinder? Okay, the, the story actually starts back in 1995. And I'm going to bring, you know, with the, mini the first miniature gas turbine that, that we designed and built and brought to market. And I, I'm not going to get into all the details because we'd, we'd be here for hours talking about it. But the same process that, that we used back then is the same process that we use today with the exception of 25 years of accumulated knowledge on, you know, what to do and what not to do. Right. So this whole point that he's making and talking about RC engines feels to me like he's just saying, look, I made something back in the day that was successful. Therefore, I know what I'm talking about. You haven't designed anything, I have, therefore, bingo. Um, the problem I have with that is it's, it's a model aircraft. You know what I mean? These engines are not very efficient. They're basically built out of parts from the automotive industry that you slap together. Not taking anything away from that, that's fine and fair enough. But when someone uses that as a stepping stone to say, oh, I can develop anything. Now I've done one engine, I can do loads of others. That That's simply not the case. You know what I mean? That's not the way that these things generally tend to work. Um, the other thing is as well is how did this engine come around? This isn't, this whole RC engine story isn't anything to do with it. You know, we asked, the, Driver France's guy asked for how this particular design came around. Not let's hear, you know, he didn't ask you what's the, your life story, how did you come to be involved with anything? It was where did this engine come from? Um, in 2013, a company here in South Florida introduced the, the very first high-performance outboard engine uh, to the marine industry, and that created a complete um, new industry and a paradigm shift Oh, here we go. It's, it's this paradigm shift, game changer, buzzword nonsense. It's It didn't create a paradigm shift. It's just someone who got a V8 engine, stuck it in a bloody boat motor for the performance industry instead of the industry as it's been for a long time, which is, you know what I mean, just getting around. You know, speedboats and stuff have been around for a long time. And Yamaha, Mercury and stuff have been playing this game for a long time. It's not a paradigm shift. It was just upping the power with <laughs> with a block from a car manufacturer. In the industry, where now boat builders had more horsepower and they were able to take their normal size boats from around 25 to 35 feet up to 45, 55, 65, and some companies even have boats in the 70 and 75 foot category now. And this particularly applies to center consoles and, and luxury boats, okay? So I followed the seven marine designer, that, that first engine that came out, and I found it to be an extremely complex design, and uh, it was big, it was heavy, so it kind of defeated the purpose of going to the you know, the higher performance outboard because you weren't really gaining much in the way of, of uh, weight reduction or anything. Right, so uh, this is just fluff, right? It's just saying things. It's like saying, um, well, we can all agree, can't we, you viewers, that an engine that is complicated, expensive, heavy, and, well, look at it, it's huge. It's like, 
Well, yeah, it's a V8 block with all the accessories and stuff you require, an alternator fuel system, charging, you know, well, alternator, um, ignition system, fueling system, exhaust system, intake system, air purification, cooling system, gearbox, and so on and so forth. Everything that you would require this to work. If you are used to having smaller outboard engines, like the old Yamahas and stuff like that from back in the day, and then all of a sudden you see this thing, you think, Jesus Christ, but we're talking double the power. It doesn't come from nowhere. It, it, it's, <laughs> you know what I mean? And the thing is, is that this is a very well-established engine that has been around for a long time. There's an entire industry in America devoted just to this engine design, the American V8, you know what I mean? <laughs> You try and find, you and go to any other country, you go to France, you go to England, you go to Australia, maybe actually Australia's got more because of their V8 scene, but you go to Japan, you try and find machine shops that are catered for camming block engines of, of uh, you know, this bore size. It, they're few and far between everywhere else. It's a massive American and a slightly Australian, I say slightly Australian thing, as numbers go, one compared to the other, the scene in Australia, in, in America is huge. Anything like that. So that kind of got me going into, you know, there's got to be a better way. How can we come about it? Again, this is just what you're trying to do is you're trying to get potential investors, people with money that you want to nod and agree and say, well, yes, everything that this man is saying is, is correct. Why can't we make, yeah, they make it lighter, that is the aim, but that's the aim of everybody and has been since the dawn of this, you know, the 20th century a bit before, but, you know, predominantly for the 20th century. I then was fortunate enough to uh, find, through the internet, an engine called the Borg 400. Uh, the Borg 400 was designed by, the original Borg was by Russell Borg back in the 1920s. And the Borg 400 was the first 400 cubic inch. It was a four-cylinder, horizontally opposed engine uh, that was designed in the, in the 1940s, mid-1940s. It's the only one of its kind. And I, I was able to purchase that engine and, you know, basically uh, overhaul that engine and uh, restore it. And You see, I've said this before, but there's a reason why it was designed in the 1920s, built in the 1940s. There's only one example, and they're not used today. The other thing is, look at it, it's gargantuan. And the other thing is, it doesn't rev that high at all. The engine was a failure, right? And that's why there is only one example. Not only that, is Albert didn't tell everybody that he's selling this engine. That's why he's got these gorgeous pictures of it. This is his engine, and he's selling it. It's so magnificent that he wants rid. In the process, I learned, you know, about the, you know, the, the rod that was in that engine, which created a sinusoidal... Uh, movement of the pistons. Well, my first instinct was, how can we use this engine? Because at that point, at that time, not today, but at that time, I thought that the design was, was, was really good. So we figured, is there a way to use this to create this high performance outboard that meets our criteria? And the, the answer was no. The horizontally opposed uh, design resulted in an extremely large and an extremely heavy engine. This is the point he makes here. The animation you've got here is a, well, it's an X. It's two, um, you know, opposed pistons and stuff. Why, initially, this is a bad idea, I don't understand. It's a bad idea because Scotch York engines have horrible bearing problems, um, but, and reciprocating mass problems, but the fact of the matter is, is that is automatically said, no, this is no good, without actually explaining why. Which would have been, you, well, you would have been better off just getting a big block V8 and turning it on end and, and using that. <laughs> yes, someone did. They're called Seven Marine. So I went off on a quest to find what I would consider to be the perfect power plant for this project. And what we're looking for in an outboard is not to build an engine that's, a, you know, that's, that's gargantuan in size, we're looking to build an engine that's relatively small, relatively lightweight. You want to try and have an, an engine that underneath the cowling, you can keep it within 22 inches. Right, this is just all rubbish, right? He makes it sound like all other manufacturers aren't doing this. This is the aim of engine manufacturing 
since the dawn of engine manufacturing. Make it smaller, make it lighter, make it cheaper, make it less complicated. That is the aim. The fact of the matter is, it's not that simple. So you can mount the engines at 26 inches on center, which is kind of the holy grail of where you want to be, okay? So I looked at it. Again, that's just, he's now telling you that's the holy grail and that's where we want to be. Doesn't explain why to anybody, but you know what I mean. Engine that dated back to the 1920s. I looked at every engine up to the engines that we have in our, in our cars today. And I looked at a lot of the concept engines for the future. So he says he's gone back to the 1920s all the way up until today. It's just internet research. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is all it is. This is not how you... <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, it, it, it's just... I'm trying not to get like that, but it's just annoying. What I found with almost all the concept engines that are out there is that they've got problems from an engineering perspective all engines have got problems and all engine anything is engineering is based be it a problem a solution a design a concept anything it's all engineering when it comes to sealing the combustion chamber and lubrication right this thing i don't understand he's basically talking about wankles and stuff but there are other engines and you're still not getting to Anything to do with this engine that's sat in front of us right now, this bloody CGI effort. Okay, uh, take the rotary wankle or any design that is a, a derivative of the rotary wankle. You've got the issues with the, with the tip seals, you've got the corners. Someone did say in the comments of the last video, which I did agree, and I thought it was a bit nitpicky. That's why I didn't say it, but as soon as someone else has said it, I can. The fact that this guy's done all this research and does not know they're called apex seals is... Well, it's just sad, isn't it? Of the, of the seals um, that have proven over time to be a problem. So at the end of the day... The fact of the matter is, is the seals aren't a, so much a problem. They work, right? These engines work. And funnily enough, it's almost taking the piss out of an engine concept that actually works and people have sold and has been around for a long time. It works, it's proven. And the, the seals aren't as good, aren't as reliable as, you know, just say a piston engine. But that doesn't, it has other benefits. It's, it's just, yeah, well, that's no good, and that's no good, and that's no good. But our secret design has clinched it. The one thing that I think nobody out there will, will argue with me on is there's no better way to seal a cylinder than putting a round piston in a round hole with round rings that you can maintain extremely tight tolerances and, and accomplish what you want. Right, so it, I've said this before, he's getting the tolerance thing wrong, it's clearances. Tolerances, he's, he's done what the fuck he's talking about. Um, the other thing that I've kind of picked up on this as well is that you say something that everyone can agree on. So if you're just watching this and you, you, know, you like engines and stuff, you've got a bit of interest, you watch Top Gear or something, crap like that. You know, you, you like your car, you like your bike, you like your yacht, you like your whatever. And you got a basic understanding of how engines work. You're nodding your head going, well, yeah, yeah, this all makes sense. And I can't. He's right. So because he said something basic, basic and obvious, he's got you to agree with what he said. No one will argue. You know, I'm not going to argue. No one will argue with me. Everyone understands. You'd have to be an idiot not to understand. And that is a manipulation, that's what that is. You don't see a hydraulic cylinder out there that's got a square design. See, and then that's him reinforcing that. It's, you know, and then you go, oh, a little light bulb above your head and go, yeah, yeah, this guy's making sense. They're all round, okay? So, if you don't believe me, look at the comments to this original video. The one thing that, that came up over and over again in my research was the inline four as being, you know, an engine that obviously had half as many moving parts as a V8. The design of the block was short. The... This is going to say the design of the block is short, the crank is short. This is untrue, right? This is not true. Let's just use this example here, right? Just say that's a normal, regular, I don't know, Ford Transit van, straight four or whatever. It doesn't matter. Ford Mondeo. do not have to be a Ford, but whatever. And... It's a, a 3 litre engine or a 3.5 litre engine. If you then make this a 7.5 litre engine, 
right, and keep this arrangement, then everything gets bigger, right? Everything gets bigger. The pistons will get twice the size. They'll probably grow by about 30%, 35%, something like that. But that means that not only are the pistons bigger, but they've got to be spaced further apart, which means that the crankshaft has got to be even longer to pick up the center of each piston, right? So you do that, and he does call this an inline four. It's not like it's like a, a W, like a you know here, there, here, there kind of thing, like a weird W. It won't be a complete one. That'd be five. But um, if you have a V8, you can have two rods either side of each other, very close, and it is a compact design. That's why Seven Marine picked a V8 because it's tiny it compared to a massive hunking straight four. Now he's the one who's called it an inline four. He's just said it a second ago. So we have to assume that it is like this. Crankshaft was short. Everything about the engine was exactly what we were looking for. So basically huge pistons with rods that are part of the reciprocating mass, massive, massive voids of cylinders, which is just a combustion nightmare. Um, High piston speeds with high piston forces because your piston and your rod are now all a reciprocating mass. With a very long crankshaft, with a very long block, is what just because it has half the parts count that a V8 does? It might have half the parts count of a V8, but everything weighs half as much as a V8, as in each individual component, right? So the forces are lower. I don't. <laughs> This is what happens when someone who does their research on the internet claims to have designed a revolutionary engine that's a, you know, a game changer. But it suffered from the secondary imbalance, which you did a really, really good job of explaining in your video. <laughs> it's this the little nod, the little nod and the little ball licking. It's just, we're all together in this and it's like, uh, yeah, I'll just, the guy from Driving for Answers, when this, when this resolves itself, yeah, we'll see how, yeah, we'll just see. So from, you know, when I look at things from an engineering perspective, I always say to myself, where is the problem? Let me get rid of the problem and let's find a new solution, a new way of doing that. <laughs> just revolution and revolutionizing engineering as well. All you fucking idiots who've been, you know, just chucking shit at a wall and hoping you get a bright idea one day. Um, you've been doing this all wrong. The way that you men are do engineering, boys, is that you look at the problem, you analyse that problem, go, how can we get rid of this problem? And then you solve that problem. This is just, it's mind-blowing stuff. Okay. So if you go back, for okay. example, you talk about balance shafts. Every single patent, every single design that is out there to fix that secondary imbalance condition is a band-aid. It's not a solution to the problem. Right. This is this really cheeses me off. So what he's saying is is that these four inline four cylinders, right? There are a lot of inline four cylinders out there. They don't have balancer shafts um, at all. Actually, the majority of inline fours don't have balancer shafts. But regardless, it's obviously an inline four problem. Um, he's saying, oh, it's a band aid. You know, it's not solving the problem at the core. Let me tell you something that's very similar to that: water cooling, right? Water cooling is more expensive, more complicated, has more parts, is more costly than air cooling. Air cooling's easy. It's a casting. You're going to cast the block anyway. It's a tiny bit more aluminium. Actually, water cooling systems weigh more than air-cooled uh, air cooled engines. And we still... It's a band-aid. We've got too much waste heat because we're trying to get too much power out of too small of a package. So we use water cooling. Water cooling is a band-aid. It is not cooling down the metal naturally. We are forces actively cooling. Every single engine, including his groundbreaking bloody boat engine, has water cooling. Problem. And as you explained, as the displacement increases, the engines fail. So at that moment, the Bork engine was kind of the aha moment. You know, if we could build a connecting rod that, that does what the Scotch yoke does, then we've got the answer to what we're looking for. So, no one has looked into this. There are loads of designs of sinusoidal, purely reciprocating 
Conrod designs. And the problem is, the moment you do it, you are turning, you know, a third of your Conrod mass, which is reciprocating, and you're turning all of it into a reciprocating mass. And reciprocating masses is what kills engines. Because at the end of the day, you've just shifted the problem. A Conrod is the intermediary, right? You've got a piston that re reciprocates, you've got a crank that rotates, and the rod is the go-between. It connects the two, hence connecting rod, right? And by doing that, you are going to have a reciprocating element and a rotational element to that rod, right? And because the big end is bigger and the small end is smaller, it's not a 50-50 split as far as mass goes, right? It's approximately two thirds. That's really loose, but just go with me. The moment you turn that rod into an, a reciprocating, all of it becomes a reciprocating mass, including your piston, right? All of it. And that pretty much is what got us on the path where we are today. Okay, great. So that... Right, that is great. Right, so we've got to the end of that rubbish. Brings us to the big question that I think most people want to know about, and that is the patent issue. In the comment section, a lot of people have actually commented by pasting this patent, and it is US 103785781B1. Now, when I, when I, I remember when I first spoke to you on the phone, uh, you told me that this patent isn't it. So, if this patent isn't it, what, what's this patent about? And if that patent isn't it, then what is? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, that's a good question, Amir, and it's come, it's come up quite a bit also on, on my end. Um, I'm going to go again, uh, go back to the, the first, uh, this gas turbine engine that we designed. Oh, you see what I mean, right? It's a straight, um, it's a straight question. Why is the, this patent, what does this patent mean, do, and what's the, what's the, you're saying it's not it, so what's the scoop? This was the first commercially available miniature gas turbine engine that was ever created that was available you know, to the average consumer, right? At the time, the solution that I saw to be very simple um, that allowed that engine to actually work. Did you notice a little bit of smugness there? The solution that I thought was very simple, as in it's assuming that, oh, it's, it's, it's um, making out that everybody else didn't get it. You know, oh, well, I thought it was simple, but it was obviously revolutionary. We never patented. So what we ended up doing was we put all this time and money in developing this company only to have people go out and immediately they would buy our engine, they would reverse engineer it. And before we knew it, we had over a dozen competitors, you know, that made keeping and running this business very difficult. So, so what happened? This is what I don't understand. I've actually looked into some of this and there's some forums and stuff about, you know, what, he did uh, what these engines did, these RAM engines, what they did and didn't do. And a lot of people saying you were melting them, but then they were going full chat and people said you shouldn't do that. And if you don't go full chat with it, it's fine. But if it's a successful company, even if people muscle in on what you've done, even though you probably can't patent things because of well, the entire aviation industry um, have beat you to it by about eight years. The fact of the matter is, why could you, you know, you're the first, he's, he said he's the first to market. Why could you not stay competitive? Why did it turn to shit? But when I started Alpha Dan, the first thing I said was, if we don't have intellectual properties, I'm not moving forward with this, no matter how great the idea is, okay? So the first thing that we did was we, we created um, a patent for the two-cylinder engine that we talk about, that 30-horsepower engine, and then the... Uh... This, this... 30 horsepower engine, I'll just say it now very quickly, that was quoted as in the working prototype in the first million pound crowdfunding. Then I did a video about that saying, let's see it. And then all of a sudden, in the, when they redid the website for the new crowdfunding, it had, that, that, that quote had disappeared. The patent where we were basically incorporating the Scotch yoke into the inline four-cylinder engine as a way of mitigating the secondary imbalance, okay? At that time, that, that's where our thought process was, okay? We then quickly realized from the feasibility study, from the in-depth second feasibility study that we did with Mala, that that was not the answer. There's one other thing as well as he talks about the Scotch yoke and 
this bark engine. There is a way you have an engine that can get rid of your secondary imbalance pretty much altogether. Not perfectly, but pretty much altogether. Which is a boxer engine with, you know, separate crank pins. It, again, these things have been done. There was a lot of problems associated with that design. And then it continued to evolve into um, two patents that we have right now that are patent pending. Now, one thing that a lot of people may or may not understand about patents, and I'm not an expert on patents either, but there's a couple of things that I can tell you. When you're patent pending, the first thing the attorney says is do not divulge any of this information to anybody because if the information gets out there, it becomes prior art. It basically prohibits you from being able to file international patents in some countries. And again, I'm giving you some very broad information. I'm not a patent attorney by any stretch of the imagination, but you have to protect those intellectual properties, not just for the, um, the IP process, but also for the IP protection of the company. You know, we have to keep an element of some sort of element of surprise, you know, for the day that we launch. So I this is just pure nonsense is all this surprise stuff, right? There are companies that patent stuff well before they even start manufacturing anything, even prototypes. The way it usually works is let's just say you're Honda and someone says, you, you know, can you look into the secondary imbalance, right? Let's, let's investigate alternatives to this balancer shaft problem or just balancer shafts in general. And then your team do it. And then just say, let's say the Bork engine has never ever, the Scotch York has never ever been invented. And someone at Yamaha goes, hang about, I was fucking around the other day with a bit of Lego and I made this. And they say, right, write all that down, send emails around to the appropriate people, at least so we've got a paper trail right and then uh, send it to the attorney you know our attorneys and they'll put a, a you know a claim in right they'll put a patent in they'll draft up a a patent and they'll file it right they'll get it filed get it filed get it filed get it filed who knows about this make it confidential get it filed that's what they do there are hundreds and hundreds of patents from just say honda of things that were never ever used but they patented it just in case. They patent for two reasons. One, it might, when we do further, you know, you do a further study, feasibility study, and go, fucking hell, this thing's amazing. But number two is, it's just, if anyone else beats you to it, just say in five years, you decide not to go down to that avenue, but someone else comes up with an idea that's very, very similar, then you can say, well, hang about, we came up with that well before you did, and they might license it out. Not because it's a copy of the idea, but they're, Design may need a part of, you know, need just one component, like a rod or a, in a specific job that does a specific task, and you own the patent for that. So they earn money, win, 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 win. Our ultimate goal is to be able to say, hey, if we get the patent on a given date, you know, if we do it right, we would, I would like to be launching the following day to the general public, okay? Another thing that it does that people don't realize, the cost of these patents is very expensive. And once you've got your final patent or your final IP, you've got a certain amount of time to file international patents. And oh, right. It's just, it's just the way he's going on. It's just a load of fucking word salad. Very basically, patents secure the manufacture and sale. Now, it does say on patents that you can't reproduce it, you can't do this, you can't do that. No one is taking anyone to court if you made a model of it, right? No one is taking you to court if you did a lot of 3D graphic design on it, as long as you're not making money on it. So if you were to make a patent for an engine right at the beginning, you'd file it in America, Japan, China. You can do an EU one. There is a world patent, but no one likes that. But you wouldn't be filing this patent in Argentina, probably. You wouldn't be filing this patent in... Oh, let's think of somewhere, Madagascar, right? Because there really isn't that much manufacturing there that can compete with you. What you are trying to do is to stop people, you know, making money out of your thing. There's a, a patent fight all the time between Samsung and Apple. And what happens is, is that Apple get a Samsung phone, they dig into it and they go, hang about, you're using some of our software or we can claim you are, or it's very similar or whatever. And then Apple will take uh, Samsung to court and basically they want a payout, right? They don't want to stop them using it. They want a 600 million payout because Samsung have already sold 
those units. The cost of doing that is expensive. So right now, our priority is to take the money that we receive from our investors and put it where it, it, it means the most for our company, which is the development of the engine. So if we can kick the can down the road on the patents and the international filings until we absolutely have to do it, then that's what we're doing. Okay, so a few people have also been asking for you to uh, publicly show the reports from Mala. <laughs> yes. Also, this this Albert with the Alpha Dan thing, it seems to have disappeared. Don't know why that's happened. Which you have been with with which you have been working closely on the development uh, of the engine. So, what can you tell us about that? Okay, first let me ask you a simple question. When you go and you invest. Oh, here we go. Here's a question straight away. In Tesla. Does Tesla, for example, I'm just going to use that as an example, okay, because I know a little bit about that, that car and the design. You know, does, does Elon Musk go out there and plaster all over the Internet, you know, every blueprint and every design of exactly how they build their electric motor, how they build their speed controller, you know, the, the circuitry, the algorithms? The answer to that is no. The answer is no, but the fact of the matter is, is that when Elon Musk or when Tesla just say, or any company, when um, Kawasaki made the H2R, right, and they go and show it at all these motor shows and stuff, and they give you inside live di dyno demos and stuff like that, they could be, you know, they're drumming up um, media interest because they're about to sell a product. It could be in six months. Could be in a year, could be in two years. Honda did it recently with a bike that basically stands up and bloody balances itself, right? Is that Shogunin, uh, Showcake Shogunin, is that show, <laughs> fucking you know, hell, is that showboating some technology they may use? Who knows? But the fact of the matter is, is they're not empty promises. When Tesla said, look at our car, they were pointing at a car that journalists could get into and drive, and touch, and so on, and so on, and so on. You know what I mean? It, it, it's not empty, empty promises. The fact of the matter is, it, towards the end of this video, even he says, hopefully this engine will work. That is not how this works. They come out, they say, we're introducing this new car, it goes zero to 60 in 1.9 seconds, you know, here's our, our range, and wait for it, okay? The wait for it is, here was one we've built, we've got about 50 of them, we're doing reliability testing, we're doing life testing, we're doing crash testing, we're giving five away to all these, you know, to all these motor shows and bloody journalists for them to have a go. You'll notice that when a new Koenigsegg come out, you'll see over the next month, 10 videos come out from 10 different people because it does the rounds, they send it to Australia, they send it to America, it does the rounds to drum up interest. It's just like advertising movies on billboards and the side of buses and stuff, and trailers, right? But they actually have made the film and they have made the fucking car. So, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be able to have something that you keep in-house. But, but, because of the process that we have here in the United States, to be able to qualify for the Reg A Plus offering that we're doing. Someone said it sounds like it says Reg A, which it pretty much does. There's, we do have to divulge as much information as possible. So on our filing, there is the statement of work from Mala Powertrain. And that statement of work describes the three-year contract from the beginning all the way to the end. But you're not at the end, right? This statement of work is exactly what it says. It says, statement of work from Marla Powertrain for engineering services, services to Alpha Dan, marine engine design and development. Not that you've ever designed and developed a marine engine, but regardless, who cares? The submission date, if you look, is January, February, March, April, right? So <laughs> I had to count for the fourth month. April, the 27th of April, 2020. Well... You'd already done your GoFundMe thing. And then he did come out in the comments saying that these dates are wrong. Well, you are submitting this to the US government, right, as, as part of an audit. If that date is wrong, then that's really wrong. He then goes on that they were talking to Marla Powertrain 
a year before that. It all it, it's all fucking fishy. But regardless, this is just asking Marla to investigate something. You could say to Marla, "Can you investigate? Um, is it worth it?" Basically, the, I'm you know I'm paraphrasing and doing a crude version. Is it worth it putting DLC coatings on crank journals, main journals and crank pins? And they could go, well, we'll investigate that. So what size were you looking for? We're looking for a range. We want two cranks, a small one and a big one to see if there's... Or three, one, two, three, a small, medium and large crank. We'll have them all DLC coated. What supplies do you want? What thicknesses do you want? So on and so forth. Exactly how do you want this to go? On the thrusting side surfaces as well? Yeah, yeah, fuck it, why not? What bearings do you specify? Well, we want you to investigate what bearings would work the best. And so on and so on and so on. Can DLC replace the induction hardening process? You know what I mean? Or can you have a really shit finish on your journals and just DLC coating the shit out of them until they become smooth? Right? Something like that. And Marla will take your money and go and do the R&D. Why do they do that? Simply because you get the information, it is specific to your pro your project, but there are things that Marla just learn from that process full stop, and they will own that part of it. As long as it doesn't encroach on anything you've got protected, then they get an understanding. The other thing is as well is they have all this kit and they have all this staff, it needs to be paid for. So they will take these projects on. Just like this one. Okay. You know, and I've had comments to say, well, that doesn't, that does not validate your relationship with Mala. So he said this and he's talking about me because we were going backwards and forwards in emails. Um, I didn't say this does not validate your relationship with Mala. I said this does not validate the engine design, right? Just because Mala have been paid to investigate the um, validity of this engine. They haven't said it works, and here's a prototype, and it's absolutely fucking great. This is just proof that you're paying them. This is like a receipt, like you'd get a receipt off a plumber or a prostitute. Well, there's a contract that was signed between Alpha Dan and Mala that uses that statement of work as an exhibit for that contract. The cost of that contract was six million, I think, four ninety nine. The to, you have to submit this for your Reg A plus. Um, certification because you're it's basically saying are you a real company and the more boxes you can tick yes look look we're asking a, a you know a fully established well-known company a name dropping company we have literally got a contract here's the evidence for that you know we're not just basically scamming everyone as in spending all the money like just yeah we're just asking people for money you know for this sh it's all this it's all about shares it's all about qualifying to sell for shares because they need this reg plus a to go up to i think it's like 20 million dollars or something ridiculous they needed this to they're jumping through these hoops to get to that get that certification but all that certification is saying is are you a real company or not 503 so approximately six and a half million dollars is the cost of of, of uh, executing that statement of work okay and recently, um, the... Which is confusing because they've had $1 million last um, crowdfunding session, which was last year. They're trying to get another million dollars, this one. But that's only two. And they're already a year in. And by the time this crowdfunding stops, that'll be end of year two. And you've only got two million quid. So that basically says to me that the last year is four million quid. So is there a crowdfunding thing next year that's going to be for four million quid and what happens if you don't get that money head guy in charge of mala from our project actually responded in form of an email to one of these doubters to me it was to me basically verifying the fact that we are currently you know we did a feasibility study you see how he stuttered there and then he didn't actually finish off what he was going to say the guy from Marla Powertrain confirmed that this contract exists, which by this time I already knew because I looked through their audit and their Reg Plus A uh, paperwork. Prior to doing anything with Marla, the results of that study showed that the engine was feasible and there was, a, there was a very, very, very high percentage 
that the engine would work. Right, so two things here. Number one is he said, we, so Alpha Dan, there's only two people who were employed in Alpha Dan, him and this other guy we never hear from. So you and this other guy did a feasibility study. I want to see it, right? Delete the bits that are sensitive, that are in the, you know, the patent pending, but you can still show. I want to see how you calculated the forces. I want to see loads of things that are nothing to do with the Conrod system. I want to see other stuff. You can just show me how the rod's attached to the piston. I want to see all this stuff. You say a feasibility study, I want to see it. Right? We all want to see it. Show us some of it. You've done it, right? You know what's sensitive and what's not. You can get rid of all the sensitive stuff. Show us it. The other thing is, as well, is that he says that they did that before Marler. Marler have now done one, and he said there's a high percentage that this engine is going to work. How did you calculate that percentage? What is that percentage? High could be 36%. <laughs> you know what I mean? Without numbers, without anything, we've got nothing, nothing to go on. And it's just, I can talk a lot, so just give me money. That then drove us into this contract, which the first part of this contract, which, is, which we have it under risk mitigation, was to then fine tune that feasibility study. And what we're doing in there is we're looking at things like, you know, what's the optimum bore and stroke ratio? Uh, That's easy to be done. For combustion, uh, for the mean piston speed, which you want to keep it down below 25 meters per second, well below that. That's just a load of rubbish. He's just read that somewhere. 25 meters per second average piston speed with a piston the size of just, say, these giant ships would be crazy. It's forces that matter, not piston speeds, and especially not average ones. So uh, you're looking at the peripheral speed of the bearings, you're looking at, at you know, your oil film thicknesses, you're looking at performance, airflow, all... This literally all sounds like, if you go to the Marla Powertrain website, and the Marla Powertrain says, you know, what can we do for you? If you read what the list of things that they'll do, you know, tribology, oil testing, blah, 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 thermal analysis. He's just basically reading out what they basically say. All of these things are part of that feasibility study that fine tune the engine. No, no, it's called an initial design. You're not fine tuning anything. It's actually called design iterations is what you're talking about, where you basically, you refine the design. You know what I mean? You don't, you're not fine tuning. It's just, it's fucking, yeah. Okay, and then allow you to get into the next phase of the program. So right now we're 12 months into that contract. Mala has been paid in full to date, and we and all payments have been made ahead of schedule, which brings up you know a lot of people say, what did you do with the money from your your first round of funding? You and that other guy took a hundred grand each out of the company. So that million pound that was raised is already down a fifth, just from you know, paying yourselves. And the funniest thing is on the audit, it does say that he consulted his own company. When you are this early in the game, that's not how it works. Well, we're a third of the way into this contract and we have 24 months to go. Another really common question was about um, electricity. A lot of people say, have been saying how the internal combustion engine is dead and how investing now in the internal combustion engine is a waste of money. So, so any, any comments on that? That could not be farther from the truth, okay? And if you look at, you know, let's just look at simple math to answer that question. Right, I understand. It. I do agree with him with all this, and they go on about blah, 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 and all this kind of rubbish. Uh, is it this bit? And the amount of money and the amount of effort that it takes to start a company like this and to build a product like this is is tenfold what anybody could imagine okay now the I marine can industry 600 trillion and specifically so tenfold, the high performance marine industry offers our company performance aircraft now in cars totally different story you know we we have a tesla model s and i could tell you once you're on the highway 
you know, you're using 20 to 25 kilowatts. So your 100 kilowatt battery gives you a four hour range. At 70 miles an hour, there's your, 20, your 280 miles that Tesla advertises. So electric power in automotive, it's the way of the future. Electric power in high performance boats and high performance airplanes is not gonna happen, at least not in my lifetime or yours. Right then, so I'm just gonna skip to this bit because there was a lot of rubbish there. Another common question was, uh, why boats? Why are you starting with the boat market? Isn't there bigger potential in cars or maybe motorcycles? What about planes? Okay, my passion, if you look at my background, started in aviation, it's still aviation and boating, okay? <laughs> if you look at my background, we'll start with aviation. We can't do aviation. But here's the reality that most people don't understand. The amount of money and the amount of effort that it takes to start a company like this and to build a product like this is, is tenfold what anybody could imagine, okay? Now, I can imagine 600 billion, billion, billion dollars. So now I can imagine bigger numbers than that. The fact of the matter is, is what he's about to say is it's extremely hard to start a company when you have nothing to show for it. Okay. The marine industry, and specifically the high performance marine industry, offers our company the best possible chance of success. And my responsibility now, and this is the first time that I've ever been part of a public company, so I'm still, I'm still learning you know, a lot of the, the, the rules and regulations, but the number one... That is a complete lie, right? He's lying. He has been involved with so many companies, most of it luggage, locks, luggage cases, luggage, waterproof covering, cling film stuff. He's, yeah, he's had his fingers in so many pies. If you look up how many companies in, I think it's 14. Responsibility that I have as a CEO of Alpha Dan is to our investors to protect their investment and to, you know, to reduce or minimize the risk as much as possible and increase. So you minimize the risk by finding out and making sure that your engine that you're designing actually works you know, the chances of Alpha Dan being successful and making money. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're in business to make money, okay? Second of all, this is something that I'm passionate about. <laughs> I love this. He's just said, we're in business to make money. He's now going to say, this is my passion. He then says... And passion drives success, okay? So if you do something just for a job and money, you know, your chances of success, in my opinion, are cut 50%. <laughs> <laughs> Say that to all the billionaires out of there. So I'm very passionate about this. But the marine industry, the, the Alpha Dan I-4 design, gives us a huge advantage over the competition. What advantage? I'm going to do a separate video about this because I've been working a long time, a long time. I've been working quite hard on SolidWorks to try and get this out as quick as I can as an example of the two. You know, basically uh, a normal marine engine that's in, you know, in mass production right now versus this Alpha Dan rubbish. Um, what benefit? He hasn't actually said any benefit. He says it's shorter, smaller crank. It's not, and I can easily show that. And he says it's less parts, right? Less parts. But each part is heavier and under more stress. It won't be lighter. You can't get energy or power out of nothing. What? He hasn't said anything. In an industry that has extremely, extremely low barriers of entry. That is the most truthful thing he said in all of this. Why boats, not cars, not motorcycles? Because this has the lowest barrier to entry. In other words, the regulations are loosey-goosey loosey and the super rich that you're trying to get money off it's low volume, high yield, uh, low volume, high yield, low volume, high profit, right? And the, these twats who are sat on this boat generally don't give two fucks what they're not to 60 time is. They're too busy taking yet another holiday from their boardrooms because these fuckers are in it for the money. Our profit margins are high, therefore our success rate or our chances of success are extremely high. So now what we're doing is we've stopped talking about technology. We've stopped talking about engines, even though this is a driving for answers video. We've stopped talking about all that shit. And now we're plastering 
our lovely CG animated uh, props onto real photographs. And I would have loved to know what engines were on the back of this boat that they deleted out. That would have been quite funny to see. If anyone could find this photo, that would be absolutely fan fantastic. Um, but now we've stopped that, now this is the sales pitch. We're going to do nothing but talk about investors.